Event Horizon, the novelization of the film by Stephen E. MacDonald. Chapter 33 It was getting to be crowded out here, Miller thought. He, Cooper, and Smith had ended up together on one section of the Lewis and Clark's hull, surrounded by an assortment of zero-G tools. Cooper and Smith unbolted an access panel. Together they lifted it, moving it aside, letting it float nearby, while they attended to the job at hand. The compartment beneath the panel was a mess of scorched wiring and battered components. We'll have to reroute through the port conduit to the APU, Cooper said, shining a light down into the compartment. Smith grunted. What about the accumulator? The radio pinged, and then Stark was saying, Come in, Miller. Miller looked up from the work at hand, annoyed at the interruption. What's going on in there, Stark? Justin's in the airlock, Stark said. Miller froze. DJ had not been very hopeful about Justin, and Peters had basically entered a state of denial, hoping for the best, expecting the worst. What? Miller said. Cooper and Smith were watching him intently, their work forgotten. Stark said, He's awake. He's in the airlock. He's not wearing a suit. Jesus Christ, Miller thought. It just gets crazier. He wanted the incentive to stop just long enough for them to get home. Grabbing a hand handhold, he swung himself to face Cooper. Stay here. Don't stop working. Captain, Cooper snapped back. You need me on this? The last thing Miller needed right now was for Cooper to start grandstanding over Justin. Fix this ship, Cooper, or we'll all die. I'll get him. Miller changed the position, orientating himself towards the bulk of the event horizon. Taking a deep breath and cursing his fortunes in this world, he kicked off. He was not just about to lose anyone. Not now. Not on this mission. Not Justin. Stark worked frantically at the airlock control panel, trying everything she could think of, short of hammering on the panel with a fist. There was no response at all from the panel. He's engaged the override, she said, stepping back, frustrated. She smacked her hand against the control panel. Can you shut it down? Peter asked. I'll try, Stark said. She turned and took a step went to work on the access panel for the airlock. Shut it open in a matter of moments, digging into the circuitry. All she needed was some way to screw the outer door mechanism. If she could stop the outer door cycle, they could take their time getting the inner door open again. DJ was peering at Justin through the hatch window. Turning to Peters, he said, He's in some kind of trance. Try and make eye contact. Talk him down. I'll be right back. DJ turned and ran out of the airlock back. Peter started hammering on the hatch, trying to snap Justin out of his trance, or to at least get his attention. Justin! she screamed, her throat feeling like liquid fire. Open the door! Open the door! Justin's expression did not change, and he did not look at her. He reached out again, slowly touching the control panel, inside the airlock. He started to move, slowly, drifting sideways and up. He had executed a localised shutdown of the artificial gravity, a utility function that had been intended to help transition delicate cargo between zero-g and local gravity. Justin looked like a man lost in a dream. Come into him, Stark, Miller said, wishing he had a full EVA thruster pack on his suit. Give me status. He was using the event horizon as a means of propulsion, shoving himself from section to section, the huge ship was blurring by beneath him as he gained more and more velocity. He was going to have to shed some of that and change vectors sooner or later, and that was going to hurt. You better hurry, Stark said, her voice urgent. He's engaged the override, and we can't open the inner door. Miller swore, pushed himself onward. Peters was still hammering at the door, her hand hurting. The door, Justin, open the door. She coughed, the effort of so much yelling taking its toll on her. Justin turned slowly around to stare at the outer door of the airlock. There was nothing on the other side of that door but space. 
Did you hear it? Justin said suddenly. His voice carried through the airlock intercom. His voice was flat, the voice of someone dead. The hair stood up on the back of Peters' neck. Stark came over to stand beside her, staring at Justin. Yes, she said, willing to lie, to do anything if it would save Justin. Yes, Justin, we heard it. Keep him talking, Stark whispered. Peters nodded sharply. Do you know what it was? It gets inside you, Justin said softly. There was no tension in his body. He hung in the microgravity like a mannequin. It shows you things, horrible things, a shuddering breath, almost a sob. Can't describe it. There are, there are no words. We, on the bridge, had moved to the communications workstation, sitting unmoving. The intraship intercom system was open, tied into the radio. He had not missed a moment of the conversation. He sat rigid, listening, trying to keep his mind blank and empty. What's Justin? Peter was saying. What shows you? Then Justin, almost crying. It won't stop. It goes on and on and on. What does? Peter said. We closed his eyes. The dark inside me, Justin said. Wim moaned. The tension went out of him. He leaned forward into the console, his head in his hands. The darkness was coming. Miller's breath was coming in hard, ragged gasps now, as he made his way along the hull of the event horizon. He had made one vector change already, and had the aching arms to show for it. He sailed onward. It's inside, and it eats, and it eats until there's nothing left. Justin was moaning. The dark inside, Peter said, her voice sounding remarkably calm. I don't understand. From the out... From the other place, Justin said. Miller passed from shadow to light and back to shadow. Neptune turned beneath him, the great dark spot malevolent at the edge of his vision. The other crew... Justin said softly. He lifted an arm, the movement causing him to turn slowly in the microgravity. They're here. They're waiting for me. They're waiting for you. I won't go back there. I, I won't. Peters pressed up against the airlock door, trying to keep her expression calm. There had to be some way to break through to Justin, some way to make him continue to find his way out of this fugue or whatever it was that had overcome him. Justin, she said using her best motherly voice, the one that works so well with Danny. Look at me. Look at me. Open this door. DJ was back, sprinting into the bay, his medkit in hand. He almost slammed into the airlock, gasping for breath. Stark said urgently, I don't think she can talk him down. DJ looked at Justin, gently floating in the airlock. Then at Stark, he stepped away from the airlock. If he opens the outer door, he'll turn inside out. Peters was watching Justin, trying to marshal her thoughts. Stark was still trying to do something with the airlock control circuit. Her hands lost in a jumble of wiring and circuit modules. Her face beating with sweat. Almost got it, Stark muttered. Come on, baby bear, Peters said. Open the door. Justin was staring at her now his eyes devoid of spirit. She could not imagine what he must have experienced in the heart of the core. Justin had been changed, stripped of himself. He raised a hand, touching the hatch window. If you could see the things I've seen, you wouldn't try to stop me. That's not you talking, Peter said, her heart breaking. Come back to us. Come back to me, baby bear. Hope surged in her as Justin's hand moved, floating toward the switch that would open the inner airlock door. She tried to will him to make the final motion. Throw the switch, open the door, get this nightmare ended. His hand moved again, stabbing at the outer door control. No! Peter screamed. 
Warning signs flashed on, inside and outside of the airlock. A klaxon honked warning, reverberant, even louder inside the airlock than outside in the bay. Justin covered his ears with his hands, squeezed his eyes shut. From somewhere, a computer voice, all modulated reason and no humanity. Stand by for decompression. 30 seconds. Inside the airlock, Justin opened his eyes, staring. Peter's gasp. Justin's eyes were clear, alive. Whatever had taken hold of him had been shaken off, at least for now. He reached out with one hand, making his motion worse. Hey, he said slowly, sounding confused. What are you doing? He turned his head wildly, making his spinning motion worse. Peters could see the realisation strike. Oh my god. Oh my god. He lunged for the hatch. Peters whirled. Stark! Stark pulled back from the airlock access compartment, her expression horrified. I can't! The inner door can't open once the outer door has been triggered. It would, it would decompress the entire ship! The computer continued the countdown, heedless of human dilemmas. Justin screamed. Get me out of here! He swung a fist at the door, but all it did was make him bounce. If that door opens, I'm gonna... Oh, God, my eyes! Peters was losing her battle against hysteria, hanging on grimly. We have to do something, oh, God! Counting down. Miller caroomed from one piece of superstructure to another. Hurtling through space in a dizzying, sickening parabola, kicking off again. Captain, Stark said. Justin just activated the door. It's on 30 second delay. Patch me through to him, Miller said. Kicking off again, hurtling along the endless event horizon. Nothing compressed about this ship, and never mind the origins of its name or its main drive unit. He could hear the computer counting down. Justin, Miller said, his tone firm and authoritative. Skipper, Justin gasped out. Help me, help. Tell them to let me in. Briskly, Miller said, They can't do that, Justin. Now listen carefully. Miller came over the edge of the ship, caught himself on an antenna, swung over. The muscles in his right arm pr protested at the brutal misuse. He kicked off again. There, he could see the bulge of the airlock. I don't want to die! Justin screamed. You're not going to die! Miller snapped. He kicked, flew on. Not today. I want you to do exactly as I say, and I'm going to get you out of there, all right? And I hope, like hell, that I'm not bullshitting you, man. There was a low thump as the air pumps started. Justin looked up and around as air moved by him. The airlock was being evacuated rapidly. Oh, God, it's starting, he cried. Justin, Miller said, his voice coming from the intercom speaker overhead, getting thinner. I won't let you die. Justin was crying helplessly, the dark and the cold pressing in on him. His tears flowed from his face, hung in the air. Help me, he whispered. He started to hyperventilate, trying to hold on to as much oxygen as he could. Tuck yourself in a crouched position, Miller said. His voice had a father's authority, and Justin tried to obey it, hurrying, pushing against the wall and huddling into a corner. His tears were turning to blood, as the pressure dropped. My eyes, Justin muttered. It felt as though someone was trying to push them in from the sockets. He moaned with the pain. Shut him, Miller yelled, his voice fading as the air went away. Shut your eyes, tight as you can. Five seconds, Stark said, her voice sounding muffled. There was a low booming sound, as though something had hit the superstructure near the airlock. Exhale everything you've got, Justin. Miller was yelling, We can't have any air in those lungs! Blow it all out! Justin had squeezed his eyes shut, clamping his hands over them. He could feel the blood, slick, sticky, too much of it, far too much of it. Oh God, oh God, he whimpered. He was going to die. He knew he was going to die. The darkness would have him. The voice would have him. Somewhere in the distance... 
the last fading sound of Miller's voice. Now, Mr. Justin, do it! Justin breathed out hard, everything gone in one last spasmodic moment, one last silent scream. The outer door slid open. Chapter 34 It was a matter of timing now. Miller hunched down, watching the airlock, his concentration becoming absolute. He had about five metres to cross, he estimated. The airlock opened. There was a puff of vapour as the last of the atmosphere blew out, carrying Justin with it. The engineer was curled up into a ball, his arms wrapped around his knees. Miller sprang up and outwards, pushing as hard as he could, grunting with the effort. He spread his arms as he leapt outward, seeing the brightness of Neptune. He slammed into Justin, tumbling them both back toward the ship. There was more pain as he struck the side of the airlock, but he disregarded it, turning himself, holding Justin with one hand while he used the other to pull them both into the open airlock, keeping one boot pressed up against the side of the airlock in case the door decided to try and close on them. They tumbled inside. Miller reached out and slapped the switch that closed the outer door. Going more by gut instinct than anything else, the door closed, too slowly for his taste. Justin floated in the middle of the compartment, his veins bulging, pinkish ice covering his skin, his face covered with a layer of frozen blood that had streamed from his mouth, nose and eyes. Capillaries had burst everywhere on his face and hands, very likely in other places too. If he survived this experience, Justin would spend some time looking like a road map of hell. The outer door locked. The count in Miller's head told him five seconds had elapsed since the door had opened. The airlock began to repressurize quickly. That might do more damage to Justin, but that was a chance they had to take. Miller despised the lack of options, but he was not about to abandon hope. He reached out again and slapped the control that triggered the artificial gravity, cradling Justin as he slowly dropped to the deck. Through the window in the hatch, he could see the anxious faces of Peters, Stark and DJ. A green light... Miller reached out, hit the switch to open the inner door, then flattened against the wall as Peters and DJ rushed in. Oh God, Justin, Peters said. DJ went to one knee, his med kit open already. Peters knelt on the other side, taking Justin's wrist. DJ got Justin's mouth open, slipped in a tube. There was a hiss of oxygen. I've got a pulse, Peters said. He's alive. She reached out pulled an instrument from DJ's med kit, unrolling a blood pressure cuff, slipping it over Ju Justin's bicep. Pressure? DJ said. Peters looked terrified. Forty over twenty and, f and falling. He's crashing, DJ said flatly. Blood suddenly bubbled from Justin's mouth and nose. He gasped desperately, choked, and then screamed hoarsely. Blood sprayed the airlock, spattered DJ, Peters, Miller. He can breathe, DJ said, his tone ironic. That's good. Let's get him to medical. Go, go. All three of them bent to pick Justin up. Miller not even stopping to get his helmet off. Chapter 35 Weir sat at the gravity drive console on the bridge, listening to voices in the air and watching a phantom spin on the display in front of him. He had tried to watch Neptune, but he could not focus on the planet for very long. He could have turned his attention to scanning for the rings of debris or trying to locate the Neptunian moons, but he had no heart for that. Voices in the air. DJ saying, Intubate. Pure oxygen feed. Get the nitrogen out of his blood. Then Peter's almost frantic. His petroleum has ruptured. Miller had managed quite a rescue, it seemed. But that was what he was good at. It was too late, Weir thought. Too late in the day. He doubted that Miller was as brilliant as a rescuer as they would all need. They were drowning and no one realised it. DJ again. One thing at a time. Let's keep him breathing. Start the drip. 15 cc's. Fibrogenin. The computer model of the gateway swelled on the display. Before him. Rendering out now showing the hot spots and the magnetic flow. It was a live thing, breathing energy in and out, flowing from the core at the heart of the ship. I am death, 
the destroyer of worlds, J. Robert Oppenheimer, quoting the Bhagavad Gita, dismayed by the explosion of one tiny atomic device, what would he have said to a power source that involved the inescapable energies of a collapsed star? The physicists have known sin, Oppenheimer had said later, only to be pillared by a world that wanted the destructive forces without the moral boundaries. Peter's frightened but holding that professional edge. Christ, he's bleeding out. Pressure's still dropping. He's going into arithemia. They were losing one. In times past, everyone had been lost, all hands down with the ship. What was the point of fighting back, fighting to survive? The darkness swallowed everyone eventually. No matter how much they might have be loved, no matter how valuable they were, in the end, the only way to deal with the darkness was on its own terms, at a dead run, giving in to that one last plunge into the unknown. DJ, urgent. We have to deflib... Clear! The bang of the def defibrillator, the sound of a body convulsing under the power of electricity. In the end, medicine had not progressed far. The galvanic force was as much of a going concern now as it had been when Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley had written Frankenstein. He with the most electro electrovolts wins the game. The diagram drew him in, seeping into the empty places where his soul had once lived. A live thing had shifted before his eyes, compelling. Gently, a lover's caress, he touched the switch. He felt the surge of power, the changes within the heart of the ship. The screen cleared. Pristine text flashed up in a place of embedded diagram. Commencing gravity drive initialization process. Gravity drive will be primed for ignition in two hours. Chapter 36 Cooper and Smith had remained outside, working as fast as possible on the Lewis and Clark. The rest, we're included, had congregated in the gravity couch bay of the event horizon. DJ and Peters had managed to save Justin in the finish, but it had been close. Miller was more exhausted than he had ever been in his life. Justin was now floating in one of the gravity couches, suspended in a bilious green gel. He had become a patchwork man. His body damaged by as much the work that had saved him as by the original trauma. We were able to stabilise him, DJ was saying. Enough to get him into a tank. He'll live if we ever make it back. We'll make it, Miller said firmly. Good work. He looked at Stark. How long? CO2 levels will become toxic in four hours, Stark said. She looked as though she was ready to fall down at any second. He figured they were all in shock over Justin, except for Weir. Weir seemed incapable of that sort of emotional investment. Peters was standing in front of Justin's gravity couch, her face a mask of grief. Almost losing Justin was as bad for her as almost losing her son. Miller walked over to her slowly, hating to do this to her now hating the fact that he could not avoid it. If they were to survive, he needed everything he could possibly accumulate. Pooters, he said, keeping his voice gentle, soft. She looked around at him, her eyes big, red-rimmed, still close to tears. Medical detachment could only go so far, he realised. We need to know what happened to the last crew before it happens to us. I'll get back to the log, she said, her voice weak. She looked away from him, off in, into her own personal distance. She was getting the thousand metre stare. But on the bridge, I won't go back into medical. Fine, Miller said. Peters walked away from him, leaving the gravity couch back. He wished there was something he could do for her. At the moment, he was not certain he could do anything for any of them. We watched Peters leave, wondering what mission Miller had sent her on this time. He knew she had been very attached to Justin, had tended to mother the crew. It must be very difficult for her right now. Stark, standing next to him, said, Justin said something about the dark inside of me. What does that mean? We looked up at the tank. Justin had been interesting to contemplate from an engineering point of view, just in terms of how much damage a human body could, could sustain and still keep on functioning. It was not Justin in the tank. It was Claire his wife. She was naked, her hair streaming around her face, dark trails flowing from her hands. He stared, perplexed. Without thinking, he said, 
I don't think it means anything. He blinked. Justin floated in the gravity couch, unmoving. You weren't there, Stark said. Miller had walked over to them. Weir looked at him, suddenly uncomfortable. That's right, Miller said, looking down at Weir, unwavering. Where were you? I was on the bridge, Weir said. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Without waiting for an answer, Weir turned and walked out of the gravity couch bay. He could be useful on the bridge while the minutes ticked away. He heard footsteps behind him, following down the corridor. Angry, he turned around. Miller almost ran into him. I want to know what caused that noise, Miller said, his tone dark, almost threatening. I want to know why one of my crew tried to throw himself out of the airlock. Weir sighed. Thermal changes in the hull could have caused the metal to expand and contract very suddenly, causing reverberations. That's bullshit and you know it, Miller shouted. He waved a finger under Weir's nose, making the scientist step back. You built this fucking ship, and all I've heard from you is bullshit. What do you want me to say? Weir muttered darkly. Miller contained himself with an effort. You said the ship's drive creates a gateway. Yes, Weir said, trying to keep his patience. To what? Where did the ship go? Where'd you send it? I don't know, Weir said. It was interesting how disarmingly honest he could be, considering the circumstances. Where has it been for the past seven years? Miller said, his tone darkening. If I had that answer, we would have been here a lot sooner, Weir thought. I don't know. Miller was losing his temper again. I don't know? You're supposed to be the expert, and the only answer I've had from you is I don't know. Miller grimaced. A man trying desperately to get blood from a stone. The other place, what is that? I don't know, Weir yelled, taking a step towards Miller. This time it was the captain's turn to step back. Weir got himself under control, breathing deeply of the foul air. I don't know. There's a lot of things going on here that I don't understand. Truth takes time. That's exactly what we don't have, Doctor. Miller said, and he brushed past Weir, heading off down the corridor towards the bridge. Weir watched him walk away. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 33, 34, 35, and 36 of Event Horizon by Stephen E. MacDonald. Uh, Great job, as always, by Liam Anderson. We'll be back very soon with more of this book. Hope you're enjoying it as much as me. Until next time, be excellent to each other, and I'll see you soon.